Hello and welcome back to The Effect. We're moving on into yet another chapter. This time we're going to be looking at one of the most commonly applied causal inference research designs, which is difference in differences. Uh, it's commonly applied because it is very easy to find the conditions in which difference in difference seems to apply. Uh, and in fact, you don't need a lot to be able to try using difference in differences. All you really need is a treatment that goes into effect at a particular time, and you need that treatment to affect some people and not some other people. And that is it. Uh, now, of course, you can say that there's a lot of other assumptions that you need to be fulfilled to, in order for this all to work properly. But as long as that basic idea is there, uh, you can possibly get a difference in difference going, which is one reason why it is so popular. So a policy is enacted in one country, but not another difference in differences. Uh, a uh, school makes some sort of reform, but not a different school difference and differences, right? All sorts of different kinds of things you can apply, you can use difference and differences to examine. And the idea here is pretty simple. Uh, we are looking at a before and after kind of effect, right? We have an, a treatment that went into effect at a particular time, right? There was some sort of event or change or new policy implemented or old policy canceled or whatever it is. Uh, and we have a before period and an after period. Uh, now, if you looked at the event study videos, you might also know that there is a pretty straightforward way that we can handle situations where we have a treatment that goes into effect at a particular time. We just compare before to after uh, with some sort of adjustment, perhaps with some sort of trend. Now, if that's what we think is going on, we might think that we have a causal diagram that looks like this. Uh, we have some sort of treatment, we have some sort of outcome, and we have a back door that goes through time. And in those event study videos, I talked about a couple of different ways to try to close that back door. However, what if we don't think that we believe any of those ways of trying to close that time back door? Well, in that case, we have a problem, right? You know, we see a before period and we see an after period and we can compare those two things, but we don't quite trust that we are able to account for what would have happened anyway right? Uh, you get a school that has a particular teaching reform and you think, hey, I wonder if that makes the students do better in math or whatever. And then you think, well, you know, uh, sure, I can look at how they were doing before. I can look at how they were doing after. Uh, but uh, how can I tell that it's actually the effect of the new policy and not just that things would have changed anyway? Uh, maybe I don't think that there's any real way that I can use the time trend that I had before uh, in order to account for that in the way that I could in an event study. We have a problem and we can't just control for time to close that back door uh, because again, we only have a before period and an after period. If we control for the differences in time that determine treatment, then there's literally no treatment left to account for, right? Time and treatment just go hand in hand. You can't control for one without controlling away the entire treatment itself. We have a problem. What can we do? Well, one way that you can address this problem is to actually make it more complex. What if we bring in another group? Uh, so, so far I've just been talking about the group that gets a treatment and we have them before and we have them after. What if we bring in another group that did not get the treatment at all? So we have a school that had some sort of teacher training reform program to try to improve the training of their teachers. And we can see them before and after. Uh, and we can't we can't control for the time difference because we you know, can't control the time difference. There's simply no variation left after we make that control. But we have a separate group uh, that did not get the treatment in either the before or after periods, and they're going to be our control group or our comparison group or whatever you want to call them. Now, this actually makes the causal diagram look a little bit worse. In fact, now it looks like this. Uh, we have the treatment affecting the outcome. Uh, we have a backdoor through time, just like we did before, and but now we have an additional backdoor because you know which group you're in clearly determines whether you're treated or not. One group got treated, the other didn't, and also there's likely to be some sort of baseline differences between those groups anyway. So it seems like things have gotten worse, except that the the addition of this additional group allows us to control for that time back door. How does it do that? We had a before to after comparison for the treated group. We see them after the, te the teacher reform program goes into place, we see them before. Um, we say, well, we know there's two things sort of going on there, right? We know that there's some sort of effect of treatment, but also things might have just changed over time anyway. And what we're doing right now is we're looking at the within variation for that group. If you think back to the fixed effects chapter, uh, we're comparing within that group over time. Now, as you might recall from the fixed effects chapter, looking only at within variation solves some problems for us, uh, but it does not control for anything that changes over time. And if that's what we're concerned about, that some things just would have changed over time anyway, it's not gonna solve our problem. But now with the control group, we're also looking at within variation for them. We look at this control group, the group that never got treated before the treatment happened for the, for the treated group. And we also look at them after the treatment happened for the treated group. And we see how they changed over time. And we look at their within variation. And so what we're sort of doing here is almost like a placebo test, right? We think, okay, you know, if, if there weren't any sort of time variation going on, if it was just the treatment effect, changing things, and there was nothing that would have changed anyway, then I would expect that the control group wouldn't have changed at all, right? 
if there's no time variation going on, if the time backdoor didn't matter, then I should look at the control group and say, well, you know, the treatment didn't change for them. Uh, and if so there's no time effect, then, you know, hey, there's no effect there at all. So if we looked at the control group and saw that they didn't change whatsoever, that would give us a pretty decent indication that, yeah, maybe we can just compare the before and after for the treated group. Okay, great. Well, let's go actually a step further. What if there is a, a difference for the control group? Let's say that the control group got better. Let's say that the math scores of the students at the school that did not see any changes in their teacher training program, uh, they went up. Well, what does that tell us? Uh, well, that does tell that tells us that something would have changed over time, probably, right? Because this group that didn't get the treatment at all, they saw change. And yet, uh, we can say, hey, wait a minute, that's probably the amount of change that I would have expected to see in the treated group. If the test scores went up by five points in the group that did not see any treatment, then I might be willing to say, hey, you know what, I bet that the test scores probably would have gone up a five by five points anyway in the group that did receive treatment. So if their test scores went up by eight points, well, then I can probably say, hey, they went up by eight points, Five of those points were probably just what would have happened anyway, because that's what I saw in the control group that didn't get a treatment. And those extra three points, that's my treatment effect. That is difference in differences. What I am doing here is I'm looking at the difference in the treated group before to after. That's a difference. I'm looking in the difference in the control group from before to after. That's another difference. I'm saying this difference over here for the control group represents what would have happened anyway if the treatment had not occurred. So I'm gonna take whatever change I see over here, subtract that out over here, taking a difference between the differences, difference and differences, and whatever's left over over here, that is my treatment effect. Now there are some assumptions that we need to make for all of this to work properly, and we'll go into those in future videos. Uh, but for now, let's look at an example. So I mentioned that difference and difference is very easy to apply. And in fact, it is a very old method that has been applied before. Uh, in fact, a very famous example came from John Snow uh, in, in the 1850s in London during the cholera epidemic. Uh, in London, and in fact, in a lot of European cities, uh, quite often you would get a cholera outbreak, uh, which is a very deadly disease. You don't want it, it's very, it makes you very sick not great, but nobody knew how cholera spread, so it made it very hard to stop the cholera. Now, one of the leading theories of the time was called miasma theory, where people thought that it was bad smells that would transmit disease from one person to another, which is why if you look at those old pictures of people in the big robes with the big old nose beak, they had herbs in there to smell that would smell nice, uh, that they thought would, you know, ward off the bad smells and keep the disease from spreading. But Jon Snow thought maybe it's not the bad smells, maybe cholera travels through water. And he had a way of testing this. It just so happened that in London at the time, one of the main ways that you would get water is that you would go to a hand pump and you would pump your own water. And of course, different companies provided that water to a given pump. And those companies got their water from different sources. Uh, now, one of those companies, the Lambeth Company, moved the location of their water source from uh, sort of the middle of the Thames River to sort of before the city. So before you might expect a bunch of waste to go into the water that might help spread cholera. You sort of have the water coming in up here before it gets to London, clean water. Gets into London, people dump a lot of sewage into the water, the cholera spreads, and anybody taking their water out of this portion should be getting cholera spread, if indeed cholera is spreading through the water. So what he did was basically a difference in differences, although he wouldn't have called it by that name. What he did is he said, okay, I'm gonna compare people who get their water from the Lambeth pump against people who get their water from other pumps. The Lambeth pump changed over time where it got its water from uh, and the other pumps didn't. So we have a treated group. Lambeth had their, their water source change at a particular period where other groups stayed the same. We have a treated group, Lambeth, and we have an untreated group, all of the others. So he started by measuring the, de the death rate from cholera in the pre-treatment period. Before the Lambeth pump moved, uh, he measured that the death rates uh, for non-Lambeth supplied water was about 134.9 deaths uh, per, per 10,000 individuals. Uh, and in areas that got their water from Lambeth, uh, it was 130.1. So there was already some baseline differences, but not a huge difference. Then the cholera epidemic gets a little bit worse. And if you look at 1854, after Lambeth has changed, he looked at the death rates again. And what he found was that in areas where people were getting their water from the non-Lambeth sources, the death rates are about 146.6. They had gone up over time in these areas that were still getting their water from the middle of the Thames. For the Lambeth Company, however, death rates dropped from 130.1 before uh, they, they, they moved their pump to 84.9 after. So what are we seeing here? Uh, we see if we just look at Lambeth, we say, hey, they moved their pump up the river uh, and their death rates dropped. We say, okay, great. Maybe that does mean that the water's not, the water's the one that's transmitting the disease, but you know, maybe death rates would've just dropped anyway. Maybe the cholera epidemic just went away on its own. That's how it had always happened before. Cholera comes, cholera goes. But 
if it had gone away on its own, we would have expected the death rates to drop in the non-Lambeth companies as well. And in fact, they didn't drop. In fact, they got even higher. What this tells us is that it was the treatment uh, that, lo that lowered the death rates for those Lambeth water drinkers. This is a very early example of difference in differences being used to be able to estimate a treatment effect. What is the effect of changing your water source to a cleaner source on your death rate from cholera? It turns out it was pretty significant and they ch ended up changing the way the water system worked uh, in order in response to Jon Snow's findings. Uh, although they didn't quite buy his theory, they were willing to go along with the results. Uh, and it saved a whole lot of lives. So uh, all of this observational data stuff does seem to have at least some sort of purpose. That is the basic idea behind difference and differences. We'll get into a lot more of the details in future videos. Thank you. <laughs>